Um, I want to say a few words of acknowledgement about the support that my research, my group's research, gets from APS, because it's extremely important to not just my career, but the career of, of the young scientists moving through uh, my, my lab. Obviously, if you combine the Office for Science with the Argonne University of Chicago LLC, you get GUP, that's General User Program Time. So I have a sense for what a shift of GUP costs, and given how many shifts over time we've used, wow. Uh, this is a really important contribution to, to academic research. Uh, the support of the X-ray Science Division uh, at Sector 3, NSF, DOE, and Compress with University of Chicago creates GSC CARS, Sector 13, and uh, the most recent configuration in NSA, plus the uh, Capital DOE Alliance Center creating HPCAT, is where we spend most of our GUP shifts, in addition to some of those discretionary shifts that we get through special partnerships. The thing that sort of unites uh, my colleagues at these sectors and, and us and the technology and the expertise is high pressure science. And so whether we are working on problems related to geophysics or materials or chemistry um, varies from day to day, hour to hour, and that's what makes it really fun. Um, the commonality is high pressure. So the one thing you'll notice about this slide is that there's a lot of logos. Partnerships are important. But Northwestern's logo is not anywhere on here. Of course, Northwestern does have a lot of activities here, but I'm speaking specifically about the, this, high, this high pressure science uh, part. So, what I think I bring to um, the, these partnerships is great students. And uh, this is a great picture and, um, that I uh, took, I think, probably during the last cycle. This is um, Ryan, James, uh, Allison, and Alex from chemistry, Vinay from material science, and Hannah from earth and planetary sciences. Three different departments, all working collaboratively together on, on projects having to do with lots of different things. But in general, um, exploring what we call the high pressure materials genome, exploring a landscape of new structures, new bonding types, um, new materials, some of which are interested in geophysics, some more material science, some more chemistry. So this is a really important partnership in, in and, and probably the most important thing that I do as an academic researcher in these partnerships is bringing just the, the best students here to use, to use the X-ray and training the next generation of national lab scientists. I would describe as probably the most important thing I do. Um, the, the process of getting a PhD is, as my colleague Seth Stein once put it, very mysterious and kind of hard to describe. It's like these people come in and a very um, unconstrained and mysterious process sort of takes place. It's very hard to describe over the course of several years. And at the end of, say, four or five or sometimes six years, these, these scientists just, they come out the other side. And it's very difficult to explain how exactly that happens. But it is a fun process. And just to highlight the last three that I'm very proud of, going to uh, NNSA labs through this partnership is John Lazaros, who's now at Los Alamos, Sam Clark now at Livermore, and Josh Townsend <coughs> now at um, Sandia. He's actually already a staff scientist there. Sam Clark, I should also mention, was part of the uh, uh, Friedman group in chemistry. So I was a, the, the high pressure co-advisor of, of Sam. And finally, I want to acknowledge the people, um, the people who I've just enjoyed working with so much. Without uh, program management, uh, Nancy and Freda, who can solve apparently any problem I throw at them, um, none of this would happen. And so there's just a list of people that I've worked with over the years, um, probably almost 20 years by now. So it's wonderful to be here to give this, this seminar. I appreciate this chance. OK, does anybody recognize this, this rock? This is not the snowman. It's related. This is another Kuiper Belt object. This is 67P, uh, Cherismov Gerismenko. Um, in, 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 in 2004, the European Space Agency launched the Rosetta mission to 
rendezvous with this icy object. It's traveling about 135,000 kilometers per second. Ten years later, a decade later, Rosetta um, came in contact, and I think as you all remember, in about 20, summer 2014, September 2014, um, the lander Philae was dropped from about 20 kilometers height. Landed at about one meter per second on the surface here and bounced. The claws didn't grab the body quite tightly enough or something, and it was in the air uh, or in space about two hours during its first bounce, um, probably around 35 or 40 centimeters per second in the bounce. And the um, estimates for the, the, the gravity of this object is about 50 centimeter per second uh, escape velocity. So 10 more, second, 10 more centimeters per second and Philae would have been lost. And that's, I think, what most people remember from that day. But what I want to talk about is the satellite, Rosetta, which was orbiting this thing at the time, making very careful, very accurate as possible measurements of what we call DH. DH is deuterium over hydrogen ratio. And uh, I'm going to talk now about hidden oceans in the mantle, and at the end, circle back on why and how that measurement of DH in an icy body in the solar system is related. Um, because it ultimately comes down to uh, informing us on, on the origin of Earth water. This is probably one of my favorite images of the Earth. This is Mariner 10, so probably taken the year I was born. Uh, I love it because all you can see is water. It looks like a water world. And all this water that you see in the oceans um, actually constitutes a relatively small proportion of the Earth's mass, about 0.025 weight percent of the planet. Is, is this H2O that you see. The chondritic meteorites, um, of which uh, we have many, uh, including this uh, example that I brought with me from Murchison, Australia, in case anyone wants to see it, are full of water, in the form of hydrous minerals mostly. The Murchison, which fell in 1969, has about 12 weight percent of water. Um, so a five pound piece of it has a tall glass of drink, drink of, of water in it. 5% um, carbon. There are amino acids in this rock that don't exist anywhere else uh, on Earth. And so if we can imagine these things being building blocks during accretion of the planet, obviously most of that water would have um, escaped or been lost to space during accretion, core formation. We don't know to what extent that loss occurred, but just say, for example, it was around 99% um, loss. This is the totally just back of the envelope example number. If that were the case, the bulk Earth should have about a tenth of a weight percent of water, one tenth of one weight, and that's about four times what you uh, see in the ocean. So the question, the long-standing science question of where did Earth water come from can also be turned on its head to say, where did it go? Is three quarters of the Earth's expected water missing, and is it perhaps deep inside the planet in, in rocks. So the summary of my talk is motivated by some primary questions. I'll give you three of them. Is there a hidden reservoir that is a geochemical reservoir of water in the mantle, potentially greater than surface reservoirs? Could it be detected? And how? Um, and what are the implications for plate tectonics and, and the origin of H2O? So I'm going to start at the atomic scale, and we'll move into the influence of water on physical properties, and then finally get to the geophysical scale of seismic detection using earthquake waves to actually image parts of the mantle where we may see hydration. And finally, there'll be some discussion at the end about uh, what the implications are for the origin of Earth's water. So I hope to get you thinking about something a little bit different today. OK, this is a rock that we think comes from the, the mantle beneath continents. This is a, <clears throat> kind of a special one because uh, we call it peridotite, but this is a garnet peridotite. It's special because if you partially melt this rock, you get basalt. And that's what the upper mantle should do. For the most part, the mantle rocks we get are depleted or extracted. They've already produced the basalt. So this is what we would call fertile mantle. The olivine grains uh, within the, the rock, these, these green things, contain hydrogen. Not very much, but a few tens of parts per million. But using very high spatial resolution infrared spectroscopy, 
we can see that in many of these rocks from the mantle, there are diffusion profiles where the cores of the olivine grains are enriched relative to the rims, suggesting a process of dehydration during ascent while these rocks are entrained in the magma and heating up. At very low pressures, hydrogen is lost. So the message is that basically rocks that we get from the uppermost mantle in volcanic eruptions are modified on ascent. We can't use them to say exactly what's in the deep mantle um, you know, uh, prior to, to, to that ascent. Um, just a quick review of what the, the Earth looks like inside. The layered structure comes from um, the seismic structure. So the, the, Earth, it, the Earth's mantle is solid beneath our feet for 2,900 kilometers. Uh, so unlike what you know, Hollywood movies are depicting, if you drill into the mantle, magma is not going to come squirting out. We see transverse or shear waves propagating all the way through the mantle. I mean, there are regions of partial melt below you know, the spreading ridges and convergent plate boundaries and so on, but this is all solid. The transition zone is where we're going to visit today. And it, it lies between 410 and 660 kilometers depth. And the reason I'm specific about that is because those are the depths at which phase transitions occur in olivine that lead to observed seismic discontinuities. And the phases stable in the transition zone have a remarkable ability to um, incorporate water into their crystal structures. I'm going to not talk about the core today, although that might be another massive reservoir of hydrogen in the form of alloys. So in addition to samples, we have to go into the lab and perform experiments. There's a press like this at Sector 13 run by Yan Bin Wang. And um, we can mix natural starting materials or synthetic oxide powders and simulate conditions of the mantle. And what we're doing in these big presses is basically reacting water with silicate and then extracting them, cooking and looking, and using infrared spectroscopy to see, to see what comes out. And when we do that, we find that as you increase the pressure at mantle temperatures, the amount of water increases. We also find that the water is um, not water. It's not liquid, OK? They're not fluid inclusions. We're talking about hydrogen atoms or hydroxyl uh, groups bonded to different sites in the crystal lattice, um, uh, mostly hydroxyl. We don't have any examples of molecular H2O in the high pressure phases beyond about uh, 10 GPA. And so this is uh, observed here in the form of pleochroism in polarized IR spectroscopy. So rotate the, the polarization, and you'll see that there's pleochroism in the absorption. So we're, we're really talking about hydrogen bound in the crystal lattice of crystal structures. And that's important because um, it may affect the observables. Let me explain. This is another example. This is Wadsleyite. So this is the phase that olivine will form at 410 kilometers depth. And it's most remarkable for its ability to contain 2 to 3 weight percent of H2O. So to give you kind of a foreshadow of where I'm going with this, 2 to 3 weight percent is not very much water. But let me point out that the mass of rock from 410 to 670 kilometers depth constitutes about 7 percent of the planet's mass. OK, so that would instantly become the equivalent of 5 to 10 oceans. And if there are 5 to 10 oceans worth of water inside the mantle, surely it played a role in buffering, perhaps, if you will, the, the surface reservoirs over geologic time. So how do we get this from the atomic scale to the geophysical scale? Well, we want to know not only that the hydrogen is in these structures, we want to know exactly where it is not just because we're crystallographers and it's interesting to us from a fundamental perspective, but if hydrogen defects in these crystal structures are ordered on specific sites through defects, through mostly missing cations, so these are be vacant, one, one, one divalent cation would be missing for every two hydrogen atoms, um, then it would follow that there should be some preferential weaknesses in the lattice during deformation, and so you might expect rocks containing hydrogen defects to deform in a way that prefers, that, that, that initiates or sets up what we call lattice preferred orientation. So um, this is something very familiar to material scientists in, in, in metals and alloys and also in rocks at real, at, 
uh, rheology at geologic time scales would be certainly influenced by this type of um, lattice preferred orientation. And so what we'll see in seismic waves, which um, not so much in compression waves, but in, in shear waves where the polarization of, this, of, the, of the strain wave is uh, known, you will see um, splitting. You'll see S wave splitting in a predicted fashion if you know where the hydrogen atoms go. So we're moving a little bit deeper now down into the transition zone uh, at about 510 kilometers depth. That phase, which I just showed you, Wadsleyite, transforms to a spinel-structured magnesium silicate that we call ringwoodite. It got its name when it was discovered in meteorites, in shock meteorites. It's blue, really pretty stuff. Also contains uh, lots of water when we synthesize it in the presence of, of fluids at high pressures and temperatures. So to summarize the mineralogy of the upper mantle um, down to about 1,000 kilometers depth, this olivine stuff, magnesium silicate, has a couple of polymorphs, which are important for potential uh, um, hosts of, of water. So this diagram on the right shows the storage capacity of water in the phases with depth. And as we go into the lower mantle, where these disproportionate to uh, silicate perovskite, now known as Bridgmanite and magnesium iron oxide, um, we see the potential for much, much lower water storage capacity. So it's kind of interesting because it's low and then it's high and then it's low. And so when we start thinking about convection and mass transfer through the transition zone, this has important implications for um, the generation of melts, all right? And that's where, that's where I'm going. So the um, uh, storage capacity of water in bridgmanite, that's the silicate perovskite phase, stable only above about 30 GPA, um, below 700 kilometers depth, um, took some time to understand. And that's because the experiments that we normally would do, the cook and look, the sort of, you know, just mix the oxides and add water and see what comes out, were problematic. They would produce IR spectra that I think are a little bit um, difficult to interpret in terms of a, these sort of localized, um, ordered hydrogen defects like they were in, in Wadsleyite. So one of the things that we've done here at the APS, at GSC CARS, is to uh, laser heat samples of pre-hydrated ringwoodite at um, conditions of, of that transition in, in the mantle, at conditions of 700 kilometers depth in diamond anvil cells. And I'm sure you all have been subjected to stuff about diamond anvil cells now for a long time, so I won't do that. But they're, um, they're, uh, they're the sort of high pressure device that you'll, you'll find in many, many beam lines now around the ring. So by laser heating, we can carry out this reaction. And uh, basically what I was observing when we, when we did this with synchrotron uh, IR at, at the old U2A beam line of NSLS uh, was a kind of a mess. And it looked to me like there must be partial melting going on. This was confirmed by TEM measurements. So you can see um, Bridgmanite, and there is ferropericlase here, but there's also this interpenetrating melt um, due to basically the inability for the solids to incorporate that water that was present in, in the system. So to interpret the seismic structure of the Earth, we need parameters like the, the sound velocities. And you'll um, find that a lot of the things that we do at uh, GSC CARS and HPCAT and Sector 3 are geared towards measuring um, acoustic velocities. And that's because they're, they're related to the strain waves that are, um, govern, the, govern the velocity of the seismic waves in the mantle. So we want to try to measure these things in the lab. There are a number of ways of doing that spectroscopically, ultrasonically, uh, and with inelastic X-ray scattering. My um, specialty has been ultrasonics. Uh, so I've developed a uh, high frequency system that works in the gigahertz range between 0.5 and about 1 gigahertz. This is uh, great for diamond cells because this reduces the acoustic wavelengths in materials where the velocity is 5 or 10 kilometers per second down to a few microns. So we can actually set up, sta not standing waves, but we can set up propagating acoustic waves in thin films, basically, and launch them uh, through the diamonds into the samples. So using this uh, gigahertz ultrasonic interferometer at Northwestern, we've measured 
a lot of things. <clears throat> and this is uh, hydrous ringwoodite. So this is just to give you an example of what we measure. We'll measure the compressional velocities, the shear velocities, and different directions of the crystal so that we are um, getting the anisotropy, the elastic wave anisotropy. And what we find in general is that water reduces the, um, the stiffness or reduces the speed of uh, sound waves in these materials. This is ringwoodite. This was measured at GSE cars uh, by Zhu Mao, showing similar thing, the drop in velocity when we add water and a further drop in velocity when we add iron. And so we're in, kind of in this uh, business of measuring thermodynamic properties and building up a thermodynamic database of the influence of water on various physical properties of, of earth materials so that we can model um, what to expect in, in the real earth. And this is just an example of the type of data set that takes years and years and years to, to, to develop. Um, you know, weight percent water versus iron content versus whatever, density, bulk modulus, shear modulus, and so on. Okay, so now that we have a database like that, we can kind of calculate forward what you would expect the Earth to look like to a seismic wave. If a large earthquake were to occur in Chile and propagate as a, as a, um, as a body wave through the mantle and to a receiver in California, the P velocity as a function of depth would look something like this uh, to it, for if it were dry. The blue curve, so the curves up here give different water content models. Um, in other words, this is water content on the vertical axis, depth, and different possibilities where the green one is very hydrous, the red one is medium, yellow and blue are very low hydration states. Uh, so this is the transition zone. So it goes way up here in the transition zone and it's low here. And if you look now down at the lower plot, we're comparing it to some global averaged seismic models such as AK-135, PREM, and so on. You don't have to worry about really what these are, but these are, these are measured for normal modes of oscillation of the planet and for many, many, many travel times of seismic velocities. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to bet anything on um, whether or not there's water in the transition zone from these curves because there's just too much uncertainty, there's too much overlap, there's seemingly no constraints, and so after spending 15 years measuring these things, I was pretty discouraged at this stage of my career, wondering what to do next. And then something pretty remarkable happened. This guy, Graham Pearson, at the University of Alberta, who um, studies diamonds, he's one of the world's experts in, in not only dating diamonds, but, but finding where they're from using uh, rare earth distributions, uh, was looking through some diamonds that we believe come from the deep mantle, lower mantle transition zone, and found the first terrestrial example of, of ringwoodite trapped inside one of these diamonds from the transition zone. And what's more, it was completely full of water. And by full, I mean it had a bottle weight and a half percent of water, which looks just like the synthetic ones um, in terms of the, the water content, which we were growing in the laboratory. So not only did Graham discover the first natural example of, of ringwoodite from the mantle, but it was full of water. And this got me to um, thinking about what the uh, uh, implications of the experiments I had been doing actually years earlier uh, were. Um, because I was melting those experiments, people thought, well, that's interesting, but of course they are. You've got a weight and a half percent of water in there, Steve. That's not relevant to the real Earth. I said, okay, fine. Well, once we had this thing, I could go back and, and, and think about more about this. But, you know, because it's really just, this is one crystal. So what is one tiny little crystal? It's actually one, like, 15 micron sized crystal going to tell us about the entire Earth. So I got to thinking about how these were actually relevant compositions to the experiments that, that we were using. So to team up, uh, to get out in the field, I team up with Grant, uh, Brandon Schmant at University of New Mexico. This is us on Mount St. Helens uh, two summers ago, deploying another sort of high density network to image the magma chamber below Mount St. Helens. To study the transition zone, you need a lot of seismometers and you need um, them spread out over a very large geographic area and you need them out there for a very long period of time. Uh, one of the 
uh, most important components of NSF's EarthScope, which was a 15-year project, um, was the US Array, which was the largest sort of deployment of seismometers across the United States, represented by these dots. There were 2,000 seismometers. Um, and, and not all at once. We couldn't afford that many. So a couple of thousand were deployed at a time with 70 kilometer spacing, then spending one or two years out at a time and then leapfrogging across, sweeping across the United States, giving us a more detailed picture of the velocity structure of the Earth's mantle beneath North America than we had ever had uh, before. And this is where we found evidence for what was going on in the experiments at GSC CARS. That is to say, taking some profiles through the velocity structure of North America along these dashed lines, which are labeled E, B, C, and D, we see this. Okay, so the colors represent not just velocity, but it's velocity gradient. And so I don't want to get into the details here, but these are actually um, derived from receiver functions calculated from P to S converted phases. So if a compression wave a teleseismic compression wave is traveling vertically and, and reaches a velocity gradient where it's getting faster, like due to a phase transition, the converted wave in S will have a positive phase relative to the P wave. So we use PS over P, which is the ratio amplitude of the P to S converted phase. What that means is that in this plot, blue is a positive velocity gradient with depth, red is negative. And the fact that we see any red at all is kind of Surprising, because as you go down in the Earth, the velocities should only get faster. This very sharp blue line is the 660 kilometer discontinuity. So that is the transition from ringwoodite to bridgmanite plus ferropericlase. We can see it in seismic waves. I just am fascinated by the fact that we can see chemical reactions with seismic waves. One of the reasons I guess I'm in this business. But the, the red uh, parts are very hard to explain. It's a negative velocity gradient. And so the way we interpret this is partial melt. Melts are very, very slow, especially for this type of uh, converted phase. And it's also in a place where we would expect melting if the transition zone were hydrous. So I want you to imagine for a moment hydrous ringwoodite up here in the transition zone if it were convecting downward into the lower mantle, it would transform to bridgmanite plus ferropericlase, which can't store the water in their crystal structures, leaving behind, uh, or stabilizing rather, a partial melt. So we interpreted this as partial melt due to dehydration reactions um, during convection. So to show that there was a, indeed a geophysical, geographic, um, uh, you know, coincidence with the locations of those red blobs, we incorporated a convection model from Thorsten Becker. So where um, the colors are red here, we have mantle upwelling, blue, colder colors, downwelling in, in blue, and the white dots are where those red blobs occur. So there's a really good coincidence with um, convection, with the convection models for this to be the cause of dehydration melting. So I thought we were really going from hydration, evidence for, real evidence for hydration from the sort of micron scale, you know, one sample in a diamond to, to a regional, regional scale. And that has, I think, big implications for um, uh, what's going on in the Earth. You know, are the, are the oceans, you know, just the tip of the iceberg? At this point, I might have said something about, you know, maybe the oceans and the atmosphere, you know, came out of the Earth rather than having been delivered late by comets, and the next thing I knew, my phone wouldn't stop ringing. I crashed our web server. I crashed my own web server. There was a point where I was getting like 10,000, 12,000 uh, hits per day, and um, it's not because all these people were interested in dehydration melting. I can tell you that. Uh, rather, it's because, in fact, both the Bible and the Quran uh, say that the oceans and the atmosphere were born from the rocks out of, out of the interior. So everybody was calling to congratulate me for um, proving these religious texts. Uh, it was an interesting time in my life. I was on several TV shows. I'd never done that. The best by far was the Weather Channel. So this is what a mineral physicist looks like on the Weather Channel. <laughs> 
So what, what would a sample look like um, if we had one from, from these depths? Well, let's go now back to the story of Diamond. This is Michelle Wentz, who um, is here all the time. And uh, she got this great picture during an internship last summer at the Gemological Institute of America. Uh, so Michelle has been working uh, with Mark Rivers and, and Peter Eng, I should say, too, um, and others on 13BMD to perform tomography experiments on these diamonds because diamond has such a high refractive index centering you know, a, a 10 micron x-ray beam on a 10 micron inclusion two millimeters deep into a diamond like we were basically spending all day to get a diffraction pattern from, from one inclusion because we want to do single crystal diffraction. So we're trying to you know, get them really fully centered on the goniometer. So by combining uh, Mark's tomography with a really kind of ingenious radiography system that Dongzhu Zhang built at 13 BMC, we could map the 3D location of all the inclusions onto the 2D radiograph and perform single crystal diffraction on up to 30, maybe 40 uh, inclusions during a single 72-hour uh, period uh, with, with coordinated runs between BMD and BMC. So now we have a haystack, and we're kind of looking for a needle. And this would not normally be a very good scientific endeavor to put on a graduate student. But I can tell you that even though we're looking for hydrous wadsleyite, there are many, many, many other things in there that we're going to find. <laughs> And so I am kind of relying on fate here. We have almost, I think, 400 of these uh, Uena diamonds in collaboration with Graham Pearson now. They're pretty ugly, obviously. We don't get them for their beauty. Those go to the gem market. They're full of inclusions, and they've been trashed. I mean, these things, if you think about the, the, the amount of strain they went through on their ascent from 1,000 kilometers depth in the Earth. But if we could find a sample from this region of the mantle just below the transition zone, it might look something like this. It's this dark thing, this iron magnesium oxide. And sure enough, when we look at its infrared spectrum, we see evidence for water in it. This is a brucite uh, peak, magnesium hydroxide. I have some ideas about how it formed. I think it's probably not enough time today to go through this. But, but this is kind of interesting because it really was the first evidence for the presence of hydrogen, even, um, at, at 1,000 kilometers depth in the Earth. Also last year, Oliver Chowner, you guys probably all heard about this one, found pure water, pure H2O in the form of ice 7 in, in a similar diamond. And this work, I should say, also was, was done at GSC CARS 13 ID um, with Iran and Vitali and Matt. And <laughs> Lots of GSE cars people are in here. Um, okay, so where then did, did all this water come from? It seems like everywhere we look, we find it, we see it. Um, some evidence from carbon isotopes of the diamonds themselves suggests that this is recycled crustal material. Um, this is a plot of delta C13. Uh, ranging from basically rock carbon at zero to organic carbon in the minus 20, minus 30 region for a number of these uh, Juina diamonds uh, from Brazil. And uh, quite a few of them actually have organic carbon signatures. So you could think of this as uh, carbon in uh, you know, marine sediments being subducted into the mantle, going down to 1,000 kilometers, mixing and stirring and coming back up in the form of diamond. But not all of it could possibly have been recycled, I think. Uh, there's certain evidence for um, primordial water, that is water that has never seen the light of day from uh, deep ocean island basalt magmas, in uh, this case, uh, Iceland. So Lydia House has a really nice paper on primordial signatures from uh, Iceland basalts. And uh, there's some hybrid you know, view now that we have of plate tectonics. Obviously, most of the water in slabs is dehydrated in the shallow part of the mantle. Some probably makes it down. Some probably leaks in, and some probably leaks out. And some might be leaking out from the lowermost mantle. This is that more primordial, seemingly isolated uh, reservoir from the deepest part of, of the mantle. 
So the, the mantle gets more and more interesting and complicated the more we seem to know about it. But it's this contrast in water storage capacity at the boundaries, the upper boundary of the transition zone and the lower boundary, which to me are most important because as Berkovici and Corrado first proposed in 2003, um, this contrast would promote this dehydration melting. And, it, and so I, I showed you uh, the example of dehydration melting at 660, and there's also been uh, many studies showing the, the seismic observation of, of melt layers here on top of the transition zone. So the consequence of this is that as the, the mantle convex through the transition zone, it acts as a filter for incompatible elements. And in this way, you could actually you know, pump the transition zone full of water, and then most of it would stay, being trapped on the way out or the way, or the way in. So let's get back to this thing. This is 67P. What did, what did they find? Well, DH um, is compared usually to mean ocean water, standard mean ocean water, which is uh, SMO, and that's what this blue line represents with the diamond labeled the Earth. And plotted here are the DH ratios for a number of different objects, ranging from chondrites, um, like, the, like the Murchison, that if you'd like to see afterwards, uh, can, can see, and then, as well as um, comets. And if you're wondering how we have the DH ratio of comets, I certainly was myself. I think it's a very high frequency um, radio signal. So there's a rotational signal in the very many tens of gigahertz that is calibrated. So these have very large error bars, but they're all above the blue line, aren't they? OK, that's good. So the DH ratio in the oceans is around 150 parts per million. Um, DH ratio of uh, most of the chondrites, they are scattered. And of course, we don't know where they all came from. Some might have been inside the, the snow line, outside the snow line. Most of them are altered uh, during parent body sort of uh, hydrous alteration. But nonetheless, they sort of fall within a very similar range to the Earth's oceans. Most comets are above the blue line, and 67P was way above the blue line at 500 parts per million. So it just seemed to me further evidence that um, getting all of Earth's water from comets would not be too easy from an isotopic uh, point of view. And uh, also, let's think about just the mass sort of balance, OK? The mass of the oceans is around 10 to the 21 kilograms. Um, the probable mass of the late veneer, based on some recent models from Seth Jacobson, was 3 times 10 to 22. So this, this uh, mass was, um, was determined to account for the sort of what we call the stair-step distribution of siderophile elements in, in the mantle. And we don't know how much of that mass came from C, you know, ichondrites, and, or how much those water they had. But if, let's say, half of that came from uh, chondrites with 10 weight percent water, I know that's a lot. But um, you know, the, 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 the amount of water that would be added by that much is, is just one ocean. I mean, it's all the ocean that we see. And we know there's more water than that in the Earth, because there's at least that much water in just the crust in clays and other hydrous minerals like amphiboles. So the Earth's bulk water is likely much, much greater than that. Um, also, many asteroids probably had much less water than 10 weight percent. And probably also, the fraction of water retained is less than 1. So it just gets harder and harder for me to, to see how all of the Earth's water could have come from comets. And what if the transition zone is full of water? And by full, let's be conservative. Let's say maybe half full. Um, so what happens at the spreading ridge, where the new ocean crust is formed, is that there are many fractures in here, and the temperature is still rather very high. There's hydrothermal alteration in convecting seawater. So this basalt um, and, more, and other mafic rocks in, in this type of oceanic crust are hydrated. They form uh, serpentinites. You guys have probably seen serpentinite in kitchen counters. It's the green stuff. They, don't, they call it marble, but it's not marble. That's actually a hydrothermally altered ocean crust. Um, you can also see serpentinite if you go down below the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Those, those green cliffs along the ocean are old oceanic crust that got shaved and off and sliced and 
piled up on top of the continent when the when the when the, the spreading ridge actually subducted beneath Western North America. And, and so it's full of water. Serp serpentinite has about 10 to 12 weight percent of water, and that's what goes down. About 0.6 weight percent total of the oceanic crust is H2O. So if we take the total amount of water, this is a terrible slide, sorry, it's my Excel spreadsheet. But if you take the amount of water in the oceans, which is 10 to the 21, and have another 10 to the 21 in the crust, and let's say another 2 times 10 to the 21 in the transition zone. I'm using these values for that. Lower mantle, we don't know, but given that it's so vast, half the mass of the planet, um, it wouldn't take much water to add up to a couple more oceans. So this is a scenario where there's six ocean masses in the Earth. So that 0.6 weight percent in hydrated ocean crust is circling around and around and around. It goes down. Probably 95% of it comes back up in the form of back arc volcanism. And depending on the rate of plate tectonics, which could be two and a half to five centimeters per year for the last three billion years, can recycle all the ocean water about once, maybe twice at most. So we're going to cut that amount of water out of the calculation because it's just going around and around and around. How do you fill the transition zone? Well, you need that extra sort of couple percent let's say 5 to 7%, not coming back up in the form of volcanism, to continue. And if you did that at between 2 and, a half and 5 centimeters per year, just using these numbers here, it would take something. The first number doesn't matter. It's to the 10. Okay, The Earth is only 4 billion years old. So this is an order of magnitude longer than, than the age of the Earth. It just gets harder and harder for me to see how the Earth's water could have derived from uh, a late veneer. And this, of course, was on New Year's, right? The, the uh, snowman, um, Ultima Thule, observed by the New Horizons spacecraft, four billion years, four billion uh, miles uh, away from the Earth. This, I just would love to know what this is. This is probably fairly representative of the hydrous material that would have accreted to form the Earth. So we'll see. I don't think we're going to get a DH measurement off of this. I don't think that capability was on board New Horizons as it flew by going, what, 140,000 uh, kilometers per second or something like that. But um, this being a, another Kuiper Belt object, but so far out, having probably never been heated and so on, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good reflection of probably the, the type of material that um, Earth's water derived from. So in order to conclude on time, I'll just say that the transition zone has regions of high hydration. We know that now. Um, we don't really have a sense for how geographically distributed it is globally. We have some regional information now. So this is going to require a lot more uh, geophysical observations in the future. I think the mass of water in the mantle and core, we didn't even get to that probably far exceeds uh, surface reservoirs, but we need to understand more about how it got here in the first place. There are a lot of ideas that a lot of smart people out there. A paper I really enjoyed recently was Tom Sharp's idea about nebular ingassing, so that basically a very high partial pressure of hydrogen in the disk while the Earth was accreting could have incorporated a lot of um, this sort of heavier, uh, the sort of more primordial water into the magma ocean. And that's kind of where our own research is going next. Um, hopefully to include uh, work at the dynamic compression sector. Um, but for the moment, we're doing uh, measurements at uh, Sandia. This is with um, Alicia Clark. Um, we're basically taking hydrated uh, silicate glasses and blowing them up and seeing how much water we can preserve in them. These are part uh, equation of state experiments, and the one that you just saw here is actually a recovery. Uh, experiment. So we've swept up all the dust in that container, and we'll be taking that dust to the new um, infrared beamline NSLS-2, uh, the Frontier Infrared Spectroscopy beamline. And we do actually have some uh, dedicated shots awarded for, for these measurements, and hopefully they will uh, lead to information about how a magma ocean, a deep magma ocean on the Earth, could have um, incorporated um, a large amount of, of Earth's water at the beginning. 
potentially two or three times the amount of water that's in the oceans. And therefore, to uh, some extent, possibly a large extent, the oceans and the atmosphere did, did derive from, from inside. Thank you.